everyone. This is Stephanie here from the Stats on the T tennis blog for another edition of talking about tennis stats. In this show, I want to talk about best seasons and how we would try to measure how great a season is. So I started thinking about this because after the Miami Open, Roger Federer had a record of 19 wins and one loss, taking titles at the Australian Open, Indian Wells, and the Miami Open all three of which he had to beat Rafael Nadal in the final to win. So with that record, it's definitely making a lot of us wonder whether or not this is one of the greatest starts to a season that we've ever seen. But how would we go about trying to make that assessment? How would you score the quality of a season? So we could look at win record, 19 to one, but how would we really compare that against, for example, Roger Federer's record through March in 2014 when he was at a 21 and four record? He had more wins, but also more losses. So these are the kind of things we have to weigh against each other to try to determine how to judge a season. So I've come up with a method that I think does a pretty good job and has some interesting results. The method's based on using the ELO ratings um, so before I get into exactly how I'm scoring seasons and what I found, first a little primer on ELO. An ELO rating is simply a number that tries to convey how strong a player is at any particular point in time. And if you're new to ELO ratings in tennis, a really great resource is the Tennis Abstract. So on the Tennis Abstract, you can find up-to-date ELO ratings for ATP and WTA players. Here's an example for the current ELO ratings for the ATP. So you'll see among the top players, ELO ratings are typically around 2200 or higher. And as we go down, we notice that players that typically are able to get into grand slams but maybe would be expected to go out in the first round, for example, are going to be more like a 1700 or 1800 ELO rating. Where do these numbers come from anyway? And why do we need them if we already have ATP rankings? Well, one of the things about ELO is that it not only looks at all of your career results, but it gives you credit when you do better against the best players in the world. So winning matches against top players will increase your ELO rating greatly. And that's not something that's generally reflected in ATP rankings, which just gives scores, variable scores based on round and tournament rather than actual opponent. So players gain points to their ranking by winning more matches and winning matches, especially against tougher players. Players will get points deducted from their ELO if they have big upsets, which means losing against players that they are expected to be able to win again. And if we actually go and Google ELO ratings, you'll find that they're available for many sports. So here, just uh, in a quick search, we can see examples for football, a number produced by 538 for the NBA, NFL, um, and soccer ratings. So just in this single page, we can already see that ELO ratings is not anything that's specific to tennis. It's a general method for assigning a power rating to players or teams across sport. And if you're wondering about the title, it's not an acronym. It's actually named after the inventor. So Arpard ELO was a, a former chess player and physicist who came up with this idea decades ago. And uh, he was actually interested in using it as a, a system for ratings in chess, which was his main game. And uh, mainly, he just wanted to make sure that when he was going to play somebody, that it was going to be a good match. And at the time, the, the chess ratings then weren't that great and didn't really reflect player quality. So Elo wanted to change all of that. So he devised this system that did a better job of evaluating a player's ability. And it turns out that the method is so generalizable that it really works well in all sports. And uh, that's why we see it um, so widely today. Now, it's not possible to really understand ELO without doing a bit of math, but I promise you'll get it. The key thing to recognize is that if you know two players' ELO ratings, you can estimate the chances that each player would win a match if they faced each other. So this is the formula. 
What we do is we take the opponent's current ELO rating minus the player's ELO rating, and we put in this exponential relationship, and that gives us the prediction that the player is going to win that match. So one thing you'll notice is that this formula is based entirely on the difference in the ratings between players. And this points out the fact that any number, any particular ELO number, isn't so much important as the relative differences among players, because that's what all of these predictions are really based on. So for example, players that differ by 100 ELO points, the player with the higher rating would have an expectation of 64% of winning that match. So this is a cool thing about ELO, is there's this direct relationship between ratings and predictions for matches, which distinguishes it from other rating systems like the TOR rankings. But then what? After a match result, what happens next? So after every result under the ELO system, we're going to update our current uh, beliefs about a player's ability based on that result. And this happens throughout a player's career. So we look at that expectation from that win probability formula, and we compare that to the actual outcome. So here, performance would be whether there was a win or a loss. We look at that difference, and then we multiply by a learning rate. And this is just some multipl multiplicative factor, and it really um, is different in each system, and it just reflects how much we want our minds to change about a player's ability um, based on the results of a single match. Um, so generally, you know, we're going to add points for wins that could be anything from 1 to 20 points and uh, equally we'll deduct uh, for losses. And again, it's all based on where the expectation compared to performance. So players are going to get more credit for big wins and they're going to get more penalized for big upsets. So that's ELO. But how am I actually using it to assign a score to a season? The way that it works is a slight twist on the standard updating rule used in building ELO ratings. So when I assign a score for a match win or a match loss, I'm doing it with respect to the average player. This way I focus only on the opponent difficulty and separate the player's actual ability in assigning a score. So anybody that beat Rafael Nadal would get the same score for that match, for example. And this allows us to make more fair comparisons across seasons. To evaluate best season starts, I looked back over the open era, so from 1968 up to the present, and I looked at the results for all men's seasons for the time period between January through March, so just the first quarter of the season. And this is what I found. If you score using this ELO-based method, um, all of the match outcomes, wins and losses for that first quarter, here's your top 10. So in this chart, I'm showing the cumulative score that those players earned with each match. And you can actually hover over the points to see what the actual uh, match was and the result. So these are ordered from um, the best season to, um, to the last uh, in the top 10. And I've also included Roger Federer's 2017 here in Magenta just for comparison. So the top two go to Federer, but they were for his 2005 and 2006 seasons. Um, so you can see both of those peaking um, at above 500 in our um, ELO season score. So 2005, actually, Federer's only loss was at the finals of the Australian Open to uh, Safan. In 2006, that was actually the first year that Federer won the Australian Open title. Um, and he was playing quite a bit more there, and that is what has a lot to do with why those particular seasons stood out. Interestingly, Sampras, only player from the 90s that ends up in our top 10, so his 94 season um, ends up in number three. And then at number five, we have Djokovic's 2011 uh, sort of superhuman season. So the start with 22 and 0 record uh, puts him at number five overall. And yeah, you'll notice other players from the 2000s ending up in this group. Um, and I'll have a bit more to say about that later on. 
Um, so Federer overall, um, among all time seasons, he comes in at 52 as the best, his 2017 start. So a great start, you know, not in the top 10 all time, but certainly impressive. Um, you can go to the blog post to see some more breakdowns for the top 10. I've also put together um, all of the seasons in which Federer competed in the main draw at the AO. So his first time in the main draw was in 2000. Um, in each of these, the blue shows his 2017 season for comparison. So you can look at how in every year he evolved and also how that compares to his start this year. Obviously, 2005 and 2006 are, are massive outliers just in the amount he was playing and how well he performed. I think what's interesting is actually if you look at his 2017 season, the slope directly um, lines up with where he was at in 2005. It's just that these days he's playing much less and being more selective about his schedule um, than he was in the past. Um, so definitely the ability, the form is there. Um, we're just seeing less of him than we did, um, you know, a decade ago. Looking at the top 10 season starts using this ELO method, there are two things I think tennis fans might find especially surprising. First, that Novak Djokovic's 2011 start, which had him at a 22 win record and zero losses by the end of March, he only comes in at number five in the all-time best, which might seem low to some. So we have to keep in mind that um, because we're looking at the cumulative wins and losses, that it's going to be influenced by how much a player is playing. So if we compare 22 matches to Roger Federer's 2005 or 2006 season start, for example, uh, Djokovic was just playing um, fewer events than Federer did, and that hurts him in the overall score. Another factor is that the difficulty of the draws that that player faced could also be an influence. Now, I think in the case of Djokovic's 2011 season, it's really more to do with the fewer events he played at that point in the calendar. Um, but difficulty of opponent could also be a contributing factor in general when looking at the results from this approach. OK, the second surprising thing is that we only have one season that's pre-2000, and that is Pete Sampras's 1994 season, which comes in as the number three all-time best start. So why don't we see more from the 90s or even 80s or 70s? For example, we know Connors was winning everything in, in, during some of the years in the 70s, uh, but why don't they feature? Now, there, again, are a couple of things that could be factors. Um, so in this approach, we do give slightly more weight to um, performance at the Australian Open. So I give a, a score increase of 25% for all matches at the Australian Open. So pre-1988, uh, before the Australian Open moved to Melbourne, you know, it wasn't that common for players to have it in their schedule um, any players outside of the Asia-Pacific area. So it wasn't really until the 90s that it started to become a more routine event, and that could potentially hurt um, the players you know, pre, in the pre-90s era. Another factor is that when you actually look at ELO rating trends in tennis over time, you know, it turns out that the past two decades, we're seeing a lot stronger depth in general than we have previously. So what that means is that if you look at the top 100th player based on ELO today compared to 20 years ago, those two players um, are going to have a different quality, and that 100th player today is generally going to be a stronger player than the top 100 player um, a couple decades ago. So that means that it takes more wins for a player in earlier eras to sort of have a equivalent results using the scoring system. There are always ways that we could think of improving these kinds of scoring methods, and I think that's fine. You know, one of the advantages is, of having these, though, is, is their transparency. They're objective, they're not based on personal opinion or preferences among players, and I think that's a real plus. But of course, you know, they're never gonna be um, the only thing that we're gonna look at when we're evaluating quality of season. Uh, for example, when we look at Roger Federer this year, you know, he's 35, going on 36. He's coming off a shortened 2016 season due to injury. Um, so considering the comeback and just the longevity of his career, 
does add a dimension to how impressive his start so far in 2017 has been. And that's something that we can't really factor into these numerical methods that easily, but it definitely changes how we would um, evaluate uh, his season performance so far. Um, so the whole purpose is for these kinds of methods to complement our assessment, and, and I hope this is a good start, but certainly if you have suggestions for how to improve, uh, definitely add some comments to this video. Um, and you can read up more details about the method and take a look at the charts um, more closely on my blog post um, that accompanies this video. So um, I hope you found this one interesting and look forward to seeing you again.